welcome back to Concrete Pastures. My name is Nancy Mulemwasisi. I am so excited as always to be here. Oh, our next guest, trust me, your ears, your eyes will thank you for tuning in and for listening to this episode. I admire this woman. I cannot wait to dive into this conversation. For anybody new to Concrete Pastures, welcome to the family. This is your family of your fellow immigrants, your fellow dreamers, where we inspire each other through our stories and we give insight on what it's like to be an immigrant anywhere in the world. And if you'd like to inspire somebody out there, please feel free to reach out to me through Facebook or Instagram. I would love to hear your unique story. I also would like to thank each and every one of you guys for tuning in every week, every day to listen uh, to the podcast. I'm so grateful for your support. I thank you guys. I continue to be inspired by you. Uh, please, uh, if you are inspired by everything that we are doing, please feel free to reach out to all the guests that have been on the podcast this far. They would love to hear from you and what inspired you so far. On today's podcast, oh, like I said already, your ears, your eyes will thank you. She looks amazing already. She's a woman who's doing so much for so many women, including myself all over the world. And her name is Chulu. She is a writer of modern African culture and lifestyle, a host of one of my favorite podcasts, Africana Woman, a transformational speaker and a mentor. She currently resides in Zambia. She is a proud mama of a teenage boy and she is at peace with it. For many years, Chulu experienced success in her career, however, fell short in her personal life. Eventually, she managed to transform her lifestyle and lives of the principle, know your roots, grow your purpose, where no stands for knowledge, nourishment, operating obedience, and weakness. As a result, Chulu is on a mission to ensure African women like myself can create generational wealth from a place of holistic health, i.e. mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical health. Chulu, I'm so grateful you are here. Welcome, sister. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> I'm excited that you are here, and I can't wait to dive into your story. Uh, did I miss anything? I know you so much more than this, by the way. <laughs> oh, you just you gave me a synopsis sit of just a little bit of what you do. We'll dive in, in um, you know, so many things that you actually do uh, for so many of us. Uh, for starters, I want to start, um, I know you're my fellow Zambian. I want to start what it was like to be in Zambia before you traveled, because I know you, you know, you're no stranger to an immigrant life. I just want to know how you came to go abroad okay um yeah so i i grew up on the copper belt in Ndola. love that town that city it's nice and small not too busy you know like if you're gonna get up and go somewhere it doesn't take you forever oh? <laughs> not like lusaka i'm throwing some shade but it's okay <laughs> <laughs> so well, no I, shade over there because I'm from Mongo, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I grew up in Ndola and um I was there pretty much my my entire childhood. So you know, I went to primary school there, and then even when I was in secondary school, my family was still there. And it was only when we were when I was probably in my grade 12 or just leave, finishing grade 12. That's when my mom um, moved to Kabwe um, because of her job. So, mm. I mean, growing up, it was a very, well, I'm an introvert. So let's start with that. And I spent a lot of time reading books. I was in the library a lot. Um, so I was very quiet, you know, um, spent a lot of time with myself, basically myself and my books and just dreaming about all these magical places that I was reading about, you know, and 
I mean, aside from that, it would be spent, you know, in the holidays would usually be dispatched to either like um, one of my, my, my mother's siblings or, you know, to my grandparents' home. You know, it would be like all the cousins, all the grandchildren would come together, then we'd all go and stay um, for the holidays and it was just like an adventure every single time. So, yeah, it, I think... I enjoyed my childhood. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. That's great. It's good to have that the, um, the, the experiences that our, our parents actually get to expose us to. I am very. I was very quiet growing up too, so I share that with you. Uh, even now, still, I have to be very comfortable <laughs> to to be all out in your face, and you know. Uh, but other than that, people find me like, okay, she's quiet, and then they see me outside, it's like, okay, she's really not. But um, so you went to high school. What got you thinking into uh, going abroad? Uh, I think it was pretty much the, the profession that I was looking at. I, at the time I wanted to be an architect and there was only one school offer, offering architecture, which was um, CBU. I'm not even sure whether more schools offer architecture in Zambia at the moment, yeah. you know. And uh, I think it was just a case of um, opportunity and luck meeting as well. Yeah. So, you know, uh, my mother's friend had told her about a program which uh, she encouraged me to apply to. And I did. So I happened to get in and that's how I found myself uh, in the UK for two years first. I did the International Baccalaureate which I kind of describe like, it's like A-levels on crack. Uh, <laughs> that's what it feels like. <laughs> but oh, wow. it was, uh, it was an, an amazing experience because the, the school that I went to is a very international community. So I was exposed to so many different types of people from all over the world, you know, in a sense, people want to travel the world and mm -hmm. what, but what happened is like the world came into one place mm -hmm. and I got to experience, you know, an Asian culture, uh, the European culture, North American, South American, all of that. And it was just a magical experience uh, that I was in for two years. Yeah. So nice. Yeah. I think that's, that's what sparked it. Yeah. So I'm sure I would assume it was easier for, for you to adjust to the life being that it was, you know, internationally, everybody came from everywhere. Was it easy? It was, yeah, I guess in a sense it was easy because it was a new experience for everybody. Mm -hmm. And we were, I'd say we were sort of like in this cocoon sort of like a it's like a an island experience where every everybody yes. is just in this experiencing one space, everything so. at the same time yeah so I mean on the holidays I had um, some relatives and my best friend they lived in you know the city so in London in Cardiff and um you know and friends I also made there um were in Manchester and you know the north of Wales so then I got to travel and go and see what real life mm. is like <laughs> mm. in you know in these cities and whatnot and you know the the UK life and all of that so I got to do that in the holidays but then pretty much during the school time I was in this you know very close space where we we're all experiencing sort of the same thing it was, everything was new for all of us and yeah so it was yeah. um, it was a fun experience to be able to be at, at least at that same level with everybody got it so what got you to come to the US I know you were you came to the US yeah so the um, I mean, just as you do your A-levels, then you go on to university. So I applied for uh, universities and I happened to get into a university in the States. Uh, <laughs> it was actually funny because I, I missed the interview. I had gone off campus 
uh, to visit somebody. <laughs> and when I came back on campus, they were like, do you know, where were you? You missed the interview. I was like, I had an interview. Like, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so how I got into that school really is God, like God knows how I got into that school. But I did, and I'm very <laughs> fortunate to have gotten. I was also very fortunate that it was a, a full scholarship. So, uh, you know, everything was pretty much covered. Um, accommodation, the tuition. Um, I think they would even give a stipend for, you know, your books and things like that. Um, air wow. tickets to come to the States. So it was pretty a pretty comprehensive package. Um, so I was very blessed in that sense. And that's how I found myself in Connecticut. <laughs> so you in were not New too London. far from yeah. me. Connecticut is right mm. here. Yeah. Wow. No, that, that's really impressive to have a full scholarship on everything. Because sometimes you get full scholarship, but it does not include like uh, books and, uh, you know, boarding itself. But you got everything. That's amazing. A true blessing. Mm -hmm. yeah, and how long were you in the U.S.? I was in the U.S. for five years. So the program, the degree was uh, four years. And then I did uh, OPT. I was on the OPT status for the one year and I was working. Um, so that was the extra year that I stayed. And when you, you stayed for an extra year. Mm -hmm. after graduating yeah after graduating what were you doing then I was working so I mean initially I was kind of lost I didn't really know what to do I went down to Atlanta and that didn't really work out so then I came back up to Connecticut and uh, one of my deans she helped me find a, a job at a after school program for yeah. kids uh you know and I was working with them. And then I also, oh my gosh, I also tried uh, working as a, what do you call it? Like a receptionist at a hotel. <laughs> the worst ever. I think I survived one night. No. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you know, the night shift. The yes. Red I, I fell asleep. And in the morning, thank God, I got a phone call saying, oh, we want you to come and work here. I was like, Thank you, Jesus, because this was not about to work. Like, it was not going to work. <laughs> no, I have the sleeping bag. I, I can't do overnight type of sleep, uh, type it of work. It was the worst. It was yeah. the worst. So I ended up working um, at my university, my college, where um, I had studied. And I was working in the advancement office. So I was doing um, annual fund. So I was raising money. You know, when you call the alumni and say, please donate back to the school and things yeah. like that. Oh, and nice. then I was also doing alumni relations. So I used to organize events and just keep the alumni engaged and, you know, would have the, I think our biggest event was the reunion every year. So you have like maybe 20 classes coming back on campus. Mm. And just, you know, it's mayhem, but it's a lot of fun. Nice. How was campus life for you? I mean, I, I cannot compare boarding school to where I went because I enjoyed myself, but it's a little bit somewhat the same. How was campus life in the U.S. compared to uh, the U.K.? Uh, let's see. I mean, every year, I think, brought a different challenge, to be honest. So uh, in the U.K., I had the same... I had one roommate for the for the one roommate who was there with me um, for two years. And then when I went in, um, so we were four in a dorm. So I had two seniors and then the girl who was with me. And then the next year we had two juniors come into the room, right? And um, that was like hectic <laughs> because there was always that one, because, you know, I don't know <laughs> why, but there was, Everybody was like calm. Like the first year we had a, a German um, <laughs> senior and she was, you know, like Germans are just like, so, Is it? yeah, like, they're so focused, so neat, so clean. So, oh. you know, that type of thing. And she was just, you know, that. But then the other lady was, she was just a carefree spirited person. 
her side was always messy, always dirty. Like she was just so different. <laughs> you know what I mean? She was a party girl. Like she was out all day. Like girl, we were just like child. Then we thought, okay, she's gone. Let's see what comes as our our juniors and. Our juniors, again, we had um, a student from Hong Kong and, you know, very organized, you know, very, yeah. you know, Neat. very organized. And then the other young lady, she ah, no, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and she was just another. She was, again, a party animal. She, I mean, <laughs> you know where you, it's kind of like the thing where you, you see kids talking back to their parents this girl would be on the phone like at 5 a.m or or you know 18 hours with her mom and then they'll be screaming at each other oh you effing shiny and you're like child <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh it was an experience so that was in the uk uh so you know and then in in the us um i had uh, one in my freshman year, I had, we were two in the dorm. Thank goodness. It wasn't more than that. And um, because my roommate was, I think it was just that thing. Cause you know, I've been in boarding school since grade eight, you know, I've had that independence and yeah. you know, be, look yeah. after yourself and all of that, you know, and these kids, it's like the first time they're leaving home. Yeah. You know? There's yeah. one guy came to ask me an american kid um very lovely guy he came to ask me chulu please come and show me how to use the washing machine and i'm like <laughs> you know what i mean and it's just that that newfound freedom and you just go wild like i think mm. it was probably the first or the second night my roommate um got she got so intoxicated they had to call an ambulance to come and get her you mm. see what i mean so it was it was just like hectic like that the whole semester it was always one drama after the other because of you know someone trying to adjust um to this newfound freedom so then in the second year i decided that i wanted to be in a less hectic space so i mean one of the things that i really love about my my college is that it wasn't uh, you know how you watch on tv you see sorority fraternity yeah yes. i was like oh, I, I can't do it and we didn't have that on our campus so you know it was a very just open campus you know um but it's i mean it's very small and all and they had different um types of dorms so mm. you could be in the language dorm so there you find people that will want to speak different languages and you get to practice whatever language you additional language you're learning nice. you could be in i don't know like the, there was like an environmental house and you know like you hear those stories where they don't flush the toilet like ew <laughs> Because you know okay. they're they're conserving water. I was like, you okay, know, oh, not no, my portion. no, no. You know no, what I mean? Like no, no. no. <laughs> but I decided to go into the the quiet dorm, and in the quiet dorm, basically, it meant that everybody would be um, required to be quiet by a certain time, and I think it was something like eight p.m. or yeah, some probably eight p.m. Right? Yeah, okay, that's and, not bad. Yeah, it's not bad because. For me, the type of people that were in that dorm were more chill and relaxed people. Mm. In the other dorms, you know, it's like party. And then um, the, the bathrooms were co-shared. So it was both men and women going to use the oh. same showers. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And oh. I mean, I mean, I love our our fellow sisters of different races who've got all of this beautiful hair but you know when they like comb it and then that hair gets into the i the know drainage. it's so disgusting it's like i was like i cannot deal with these things and then it would be like you know where people get drunk then they go puke in the door in the bathrooms and then yes i couldn't do that lifestyle so i said let me go to the quiet dorm where people are chill and they, they that's not the lifestyle they want <laughs> so you know you rarely find such you know gross um scenes and things like that so that's where i was for two years i think it was two years yeah so for two years 
in my junior year, I went and studied abroad in Spain. And then in my final year, I lived in an apartment. So it's a themed apartment. You basically apply, you tell them that, oh, we want to do this sort of um, theme for uh, you for, for the year. So you hold different events according to your theme. So I think we had mm. like, a, there's probably like an African women theme, obviously, like. Of course, <laughs> what else did I do? And you're all <laughs> about African women, okay? Which I'm you so know, proud of. That is a lot of just thinking about it. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we lived in an apartment and yeah, so I was in the apartment for my final year. And uh, at least there you can say, I know these people. So these are the people I want to live with. Yeah, so it was a different experience every single year. How was Spain? Oh my gosh, Spain was the best time ever of my life. Listen, <laughs> I, I, when I when I saw that you went to Spain, I was like, geez, she, she, she just lived my, my little dream over there. <laughs> I love Spain, listen. I, uh, I was there for six months. I studied, uh, I went to, to do my, I think it was the, what do you call it? The second semester there um, in my junior year. And I was, and then I stayed a bit longer and I was there for about six months. It was just the best. We, I don't even know why they called it study abroad, to be honest, because I don't really recall much studying. There was a lot of drinking, a lot of parties. <laughs> It was just a great time. We traveled. uh, So we traveled around Spain. We um, also managed to go to um, Lisboa. So we went to Portugal. Then I decided since I was um, in the region, I went to see my friends in the UK. So I went there as well and came back. Listen, we went on a trip to Madrid. I think it was two maybe it was about two days that we were there and we did not sleep. We were, I remember being in a museum and we were walking around and I fell asleep standing up. That's how <laughs> tired I was. It was insane. Those people have the most beautiful clubs I've ever seen in the world. I, cause I usually like to like try and experience. Yes, like, of course. As we should, I honestly. And the, the beauty every, of it. If we club is just so unique so beautiful so actually I had been to Spain when I was in the UK um we did a a short trip there and I was like I have to come back to this country and experience it you know better so that's why I really wanted to go to Spain and I had actually applied to go to Japan so I wanted to do my first year in Japan my first semester in Japan and then my second semester in Spain but they refused so I was like it's okay so I did the whole Spain thing. I loved it. It was amazing. Listen, the, the fact that we travel somewhere in all these different countries, why not experience it? And the Ex- fact that you were experiencing it, I can't wait now to go to Spain even more. My birthday is coming up. You know, you guys can, you, Muma, and I, me can go. You know, yes. let's go to Spain. Because yes. <laughs> I was in, um, I was studying in Barcelona. And, you know, I think I, I went, I did different um, housing options. I did a, I think I did an apartment. And then the first one, I think there were bed bags or I don't know what was wrong with it. Or there was like a gas leak. Then I had to move. <laughs> mm. So, um, but, you know, I really got to be like immersed in the culture. And it was just, Barcelona is just so metropolitan. I mean, just the way New York is, but I I don't know why I feel safer in Barcelona. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's beautiful. That's beautiful that you feel that that way. Mm -hmm. No, that's really good. Um, So you were out uh, from Zambia for how long? Uh, Seven years. Seven years. So I I know that... um, a lot of the times when we are out out of the country and we decide to go back home, uh, a lot of people have a lot of expectations. This person mm-hmm. was abroad and um, they expect for you to come with a lot of money. They expect for you to come with a lot of education that you went for, skill, uh, connections, uh, business ideas that uh, usually we may not have when we are back home. So how was it? for you when you went back home yeah it was it was an interesting time 
So what happened was in my senior year, um, I think it was probably the first semester, I had my son mm. and then I was fortunate because my mom came to get him and then I was able to finish the year and then I graduated and then I stayed on for that extra year. Mm. Now the plan was that, you know, once I had settled, got a job, then, um, then my son would come back. So, I mean, he's technically American. So, you know, he's fine. <laughs> yeah. But I, when I had applied for like the work visa, what they said was they rejected the application because it wasn't in line with what I had studied. So I'd studied architectural studies and I was doing, um, I was doing PR basically, you know, fundraising plus yeah. alumni relations. Um, but you were doing, so to, that, you were what doing what you could do to make a living at that time. Yeah. So, but then they were like, it's not matching up with, with your, your work. So, mm. um, he denied the visa and I was like, okay, so I am going to go back <laughs> because uh -huh. I, I'm just, I don't, I don't know how people do it, but I can't do the, like that illegal life, you know, the illegal status, that type of thing. Yeah. And I was just like, you know what, it's better. Let me just go back, see what happens. But what happened with that, it was a very sudden, cause I was a expecting to stay you know what I mean so it's not like I had prepared or I had made any plans mm -hmm. of what I was going to do when I go back and things like that so I think uh, probably two months before I had to leave you know I started thinking okay I need to I basically need to let's say try and find some sort of job um, before I actually go so I started applying to different places um, whilst I was still in the states and um, and then I got, a, I think I got a, a response from a lodge, um, they needed a manager and then I was like, okay, so when I did get back, I tried that particular job and it just wasn't great. It wasn't a great fit. Um, the work environment was very toxic. Mm. So I decided to leave. So I think I was probably there for about a month. And then I was like, okay, now I'm just like starting from like zero. <laughs> mm. Like it was like a proper zero, you know? And um, so basically when I was coming back, I was coming back, you know, as somebody who's unemployed, doesn't have any money, um, is a single parent. Um, you know, there was just a lot of things that are just weighing against me as an individual and unfortunately in that time I had a fallout with my mother and then she kicked me out of the house so then now I became um, homeless at the same time so I've got like a baby I'm homeless and then I like I, ha I mean even if I say I've got papers from the states <laughs> so yes, get me anywhere. yeah <laughs> Oh God. So um, I tried reaching out to some of my family members and they weren't able to take me in. And I ended up with some friends of mine and I was squatting with them for some time. So I had also started at the time I had started a fashion company, a fashion design company. So I did um, Zambia Fashion Week. Um, I was featured in a magazine and things like that. But nice. you know, when you're, you're, like yeah, surviving, you're basically on survival mode. It yeah. just wasn't enough. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I just said that, you know, at this stage, it's not bringing in enough income and I can't uh, keep on. I, I love it. I love fashion. I love clothes, <laughs> as most people would know. Yeah. But it just wasn't sustaining me. And especially at the stage that I was at in my life. So I had to drop that. And then, you know, I was trying to look for something maybe a bit more permanent and all. Now, I think one of the things that I came to appreciate is that, you know, when we go to universities or, you know, to go and study abroad or whatever it is, I think mm. we need to be very um, discerning of the types of courses that we're choosing, right? So, for example, because, you know, some of these things are just not transferable from whatever country you've studied yeah. in, and then you bring what, you know, you bring those studies. So, you know, you find that somebody has, has gone and studied to be a, 
a, an aeronautic engineer and stuff and then there's no aeronautics in their country so what do you do with that you know what i mean True. oh you go and study to be a philosopher like yes so, what no, do you want to do with that it's like, true. <laughs> so you know you need to be a bit more discerning in, in terms and just i think doing a bit more research in terms of is this something that is i'm able to transfer my skills back um and be able to use them when I go back. I think, you know, in African society, we're very literal about our- Let's Say that again, people. yeah. You know? So people, when you apply for something, they want to know that, okay, you're applying for accounts, then you did an accounting course. Yes. Not that, you know what I mean? So, and then the thing is, I went to a liberal arts school, okay? And if you're not familiar with a liberal arts school, it is one that allows you to explore different, um, different departments, I'd say. Like, you know, you, you do humanities, you do sciences. So even if you went in as, oh, I'm going in as a pre-med, they're going to make you do a language. They're going to make you do, <laughs> you know, the things, they'll make you do something creative so that they want to make sure that you expose yourself to different things and you're not bo boxing in yourself straight mm. away. You know, Because a lot of times our parents will be, um, very influensive in terms of saying that no I want my child to be a doctor so you are going to be a doctor and then you go there and you hate it you know what I mean <laughs> but the but the liberal arts experience really helps you to say to explore other areas and then you'll be like oh guess what I like to be an artist and then suddenly you you choose a major as an artist and then that's the career you're going to go into you know so now, when I say that I have a, a, a degree from a, um, a liberal arts college, like people don't understand that I am able to adapt to I'm different environments very easily. You know, I am not a very rigid person. Like I'm not just, you know, in this one space, like this one box. So when I'm trying to apply to different places, they don't understand that I'm actually a very versatile person. <laughs> you know what I mean? So again, that um, miscommunication, all of that is like a lot of tension when you're trying to apply for jobs here. And I mean, in the end, I think it probably took me about maybe two years before I actually got a job. And then even when I did get a job, it was basically just nepotism, if we're just being honest. So my cousin, um, her friend had a, a position as a receptionist. And um, so she said, listen, my, my cousin is amazing. Can you please hire her? So I went for an interview and I was hired for this position as a receptionist. Now you can imagine I've got like a whole bachelor's degree. And then you've got people in higher positions than me that are managers, that are, you know, what consultants and all of that. And then they've got certificates, you know. <laughs> and for me, that was just like devastating, where you really just have to realize that you're starting from the bottom 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 and you have to work your way up you know and in that particular job i would when you know when somebody leaves and things like that i would try and apply for like a position and the ceo wouldn't give me that position and i was just like i think maybe after two i was like sis what is going on <laughs> And she was just like, no, 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 no. You, you shouldn't be here. I want you to apply. Uh, you need to go and do something else. And yeah, so I eventually applied for something else. And then the next job that I got was a, um, an, as an office manager for a startup company. And then from there, I was a, a hotel manager um, for a group of hotels, which was very hectic. Listen, people in that industry, you are blessed. Bless you, child. Because I burnt out and I was like, oh, I'm done. So I left that one. <laughs> and then, you know, I think I was just kind of okay with <laughs> just getting a bit of rest because it was hectic. It was, I think, six days on, one day off. And then even on that one day as the manager, I was still on call. So if there was an emergency, anything, people would call me. I was literally on call 24-7. And it was, it was a very... Um, difficult space um to work in and i decided that you know my health is more important than the space <laughs> wow. so 
I was ready for like a break and yeah and I think maybe after two months or so then everybody's looking at me at home like and I think by that time I had uh, reconciled with my mom so I was um, back at her house and you know my grandmother was there and everybody's looking at me like so you are just going to sit <laughs> like you don't want to work <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, you know what? I, I am perfectly fine doing this life. <laughs> but the truth was, I wasn't really just sitting. Um, my mother had retired and she was, she's like a very busy person. She's very energetic. So when she was retiring, she had said that, oh my God, I'm going to be so bored. You know, what am I going to do? And I said to her, you know, you, we've been doing this baking thing for such a long time. Why don't you now like really kick it up a notch and let's take it to another level so we had started a baking company um and you know her speciality was the baking part and then I was like with an artistic background I was the person that was doing the decorations plus mm. I also loved the the whole building the business so you know be it the the yeah. brand social media and you know that's when social media had just started um in in zambia like facebook had just been introduced and you know we were on the forefront of really using that so i was mm. really into that type of uh that's what i was doing but then you know again when your parents you know your family is not seeing you getting up in the morning putting on a suit going to an office it's like ah this child is not working <laughs> <laughs> like she just sits at home can you imagine like you know what i mean and they i'm talking about you in front of me like you can't even hear them <laughs> right and i'm like anyway so i eventually decided to apply for a job um it was like a part-time at alliance francaise and i got that i did a festival for them i organized a festival for them and then they decided to keep me on. Um, and then after that, I applied uh, for another position with um, a school. So I was working in the admissions office and um, the administrative office of uh, an international school. And I was there for six years. And it's so funny because everybody's now like, you, this is the longest you've ever stayed in one place. <laughs> Because <laughs> most places would be like two years, one year, whatever, you know. Yeah. And they're just like, yeah, but you stayed. But <laughs> I mean, beyond that, I, I, so I recently left that particular position. I left in December, and now I've decided to pursue my own things. And as you know, I'm busy with a ton of my a own lot business. of things. A lot of yeah. things. <laughs> Chulu, you have shared so much uh, nuggets into this whole, um, in your journey. Um, the, I'm, I'm so glad that you actually dissected the liberal arts because I have the same degree as you have. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I can't imagine going home now and not be able to get a job because of the degree that I have. Yeah. That must have been very depressing to go through that. I cannot imagine um, seeing people that don't have, I guess, the exposure like you have, the skills that you have, and being where you've been in so many countries, you get exposed to so much and then not being able to use those skills that you've learned. Mm, yeah just because somebody feels that sometimes maybe you're overqualified or they're not familiar with that type of degree being that everything yeah. is like straight uh doctor you have to be to have that degree that i went to do do uh, a doctor a nurse mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. accounting and for some people uh to be honest with you even the people that have had um accounting that have started accounting and they go back home some of the stories i've heard you're overqualified. Yeah, there's definitely the flip side of that in being overqualified. And, you know, I think it's something where you kind of have to tell yourself, am I okay with that pay cut? Will I be fine with it when I go back home? Because, you know, you're being paid in dollars, in pounds. Mm -hmm. And then if you start now, like, you know, translating yeah. what you're being paid that side to what you're being paid here, then it becomes like depressing. It's sort of like when you just go abroad, right? Yeah. And you're, you're, you're looking at the price like, oh my God, it's $5. I could do this. Like at home when I go to do my hair, it costs me 
<laughs> yes. You know what no. I mean? 50, wait, or it. <laughs> no, it, it, it's, it's, so it's nice that you actually. Comparison. So even yeah. when you're coming back home, you're also doing the same type of comparison. You're thinking about, oh, I, I used to get paid this and this amount in mm-hmm. dollars or whatever it is. And I think you kind of just have to find that space where um, you're not doing that comparison, you know, and you, th- you, you, you basically find something that is within reason of what you're able to survive on. Right. Yeah. So I think that's the first thing that you'd have to decide. The other thing is I think, I believe that a lot of people that are coming back into the country have to just create their own jobs because, you know, one, it's like the work culture is just different. You know, you're so used to people being on time. I mean, I show up for things on time all the time. And then I always say to myself, Chulu, why do you do this to yourself? (laughs) Like by now you should know. (laughs) You know, I show up for these like these African time. What can I get together? And it's like four hours later, that's when they're starting. And then they have no remorse whatsoever. And I'm just thinking, are you people out of your mind? And then wow. it drives me nuts. You know, there are things like that where you become accustomed to working in a certain way, working at a certain um with a certain work ethic yeah, and sometimes it becomes difficult to adjust to working in certain environments. And even when you go into those environments, you know, you will find that people are so set in their ways. They're set in, Oh, this is how we always do it. This is how it's always been done mm-hmm. you with your, with your ideas. Who do you think you are? You uh-huh. know, so all of this resistance and I mean you can fight for some time but then sometimes you get tired of fighting all the time and then also you know there's also just that thing of people sabotaging you you know so you know if you find yourself in a space where someone is that malicious and wants to bring you down in some way those things happen as well. And I mean, yeah. if we want to even get a bit deeper, there's also the thing called witchcraft, where yes, <laughs> you know, some people have been, have been kissed. And then it's like, is this really worth it? Is the struggle really worth it? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, I want to live a long life. So sometimes <laughs> I feel like it's, it's a bit easier when you create something for yourself when you're coming back. Um, if you're not going to find a job with, um, let's say an international organization, you know, mm. whatever it is, sometimes I feel like it's easier to just say, I'm going to create this, this business or whatever, and let me just run with it so that you can run it in the standard and the way that you want. I mean, it's difficult in terms of training people, but you can get there. No, that's really good advice. Um, I want to go back to your son and you are a mother of your teenage boy. Uh, for parents that are out there and have their kids let's say back home and you know parents their parents are helping raise their kids for them our family members how was that bond with you when you came back and building that relationship how old was he first when you came back home he was going on to two. Oh, so he was very young so I was just going for one year yeah oh got you but how was the relationship because i'm sure he got used to to your mom being Mm -hmm. somewhat of a mother to him yeah yeah definitely I mean he has like a hundred mothers let's just start with that (laughs) as we all are (laughs) as we all do so I think one of the things I've always accepted like I feel like I don't really feel like he's my son alone and he's always been everybody's son Mm -hmm. and I think I just relinquish that instead of trying to hold on to oh this is my child you know I'm just like let her let, yes be all mothers it's fine <laughs> but I think for me it was very um it was a challenge because uh one I wasn't necessarily ready to have children so you know just the whole adjustment of oh okay now I'm responsible of uh, another human being and you know and it's be I think in the in the year that we're apart, I was providing financially and things like that. But then when you are physically present, then you have to not just provide financially, there's yeah. emotional support, there's you know, 
the the physicalness of it all so for me it was a bit of a challenge and yeah. like I said I'm also like a um I'm an introvert and my therapist also told me that I have um what is it called like oh I forgot on the term lord attachment you know when you you got different types of attachment and my attachment is is like a detached one <laughs> that's a long story it's a story for another day but it just means that I, I'm usually more withdrawn um so I have to be more intentional about being um present you know, physically present yeah. yeah emotionally mentally and physically present that's something that I have to work on um with more effort like I literally look at other women um and they're just amazing mothers. They're just so naturally at it, you know. I've got my friend, my sister's friend, she has, she has, she had like a little boy, like I think he was probably about three years old or two. And then she had a baby. And, you know, so she was breastfeeding the baby. And then the other the other son had like a whole tantrum. And he was like, ah, you know, so he was in the basement. And then he came up. Ah, and she was just so calm about it. She was like, honey, breathe. Just breathe in. And I was like, <laughs> I would have been like, Chow. you know. Oh, some people are not supposed to be mothers like that. So, <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I was afraid. I, I, listen, this motherhood parent card, we are all learning through it. Um, mm. I admire my sister. My sister has three kids. Oh, even when she didn't her. have kids, she, even when she didn't have kids, she's one of those people who just gravitates to one little, little ones. Like she sees them. She's so motherly. She's so, for me, I had to learn my, I had to teach myself into, into it. I'm like you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have <laughs> always been by myself in my head and really physically I've always, so I'm, I don't even know. People would call me maybe a loner, but I'm okay with being by myself because I'm comfortable with my yeah. own company. And it doesn't mean I don't want to have people around. It's just, I'm very comfortable with that part of me that mm -hmm. it's okay to be by myself. And the, the attachment of me being with people, it, it, it's very, you know, I can detach myself. Exactly. It's like yeah. a, a second thought. That's what it is. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, so I know you went through some hard times. What advice would you give somebody out there? Like how to get out of those hard times when you came home? Because I know we, you, it's, this is not the whole story. We all have bigger stories outside mm -hmm. this. So what advice would you give somebody out there like going through a similar situation they have left their country they're going to wherever their country is and is not the same like it was or what they're thinking it will be when they get home whether they have money or they don't or they have the degree or they don't and they go back home and you know they start over yeah I think the first thing is, you know, when we ha we had gone out, we didn't have this thing called social media. Mm. <laughs> there was no WhatsApp. We were using phone cards. The yes. phone cards would cut after like two minutes. You'd be like, hello, okay. You know, <laughs> so the contact True. with family, with friends, True. it was very, you know, few and far between, very hard to maintain. And for me, that's, I, I it was why I found the state's challenging is that it seems so much further to get back home at least in the uk i would be able to go and come back to zambia i visit more often like when i was in the mm. states i never i think i came back once in those five years that i was there i think i came back once to zambia but wow. the other times i was just in the states you know so for me i feel that you know when you are looking at where does my life what where do i want my life to go what are my goals is my goal to be um am i really just setting up roots here like whatever country you've gone to mm -hmm. or am i intending to go back to um, my home country or you know whatever country so i feel that 
you know, if your goal is to go back, I believe that, you know, you need to be very intentional about um, maintaining and creating networks. So, you know, people do business with people who they trust. People hire people they know. Um, and as much as we want it to be like, oh, no, it's an African thing that is like, uh, corruption no no that's just that's just fact <laughs> you do business with people that you know and you trust or you get a referral from a friend mm -hmm. so it's very important to have a network a strong network you know so stay tapped into your home country whether it's joining the facebook groups or you know or um, following certain people. I don't know what it is that's going to keep you connected, you know, whether it's your high school WhatsApp group or, you know, yeah. whatever it is, but stay connected. Don't be like, hey, me, I've arrived where right? I'm so, I'm too big to be talking to you people. You know, like, it's just not going to get you anywhere. <laughs> you know? So I think that's the first thing. Like, make sure that you are intentional about your network so that when you come back, you're about to come back, you know, you reach out to your network and say, these are my qualifications. These are the things that I'm interested in going into and in pursuing. If you hear a job that's in this line, let me know. And then, you know, people can be sending you the job applications and, you know, the, the postings and things like that. Yeah. And it'll be so much easier for you. I feel like you don't need to go through two years of, you know, <laughs> hitting the, the, the pavement and all of that stuff. Mm. Uh, I think that when you come back as well, you just, I, you, you need, I think you need to be humble because in all honesty, nobody gives, oh, I was going to be rude. Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> nobody cares about, oh, me, I went to Spain. Oh, me, I saw X, Y, you know, I was in New York. I was in, you know, whatever experience, they really don't care in all honesty, sometimes they'll feel like, ah, this person has just come to show off, you know, and they'll catch <laughs> feelings from that. So I feel like, you know, you have to put yourself in a, a space where you don't have airs, you are humble, and you're also willing to start, um, like, either from the, from wherever you're going to start, but it may not be uh, the type of job that you know you are able to do mm. but you know if you have a goal you get to where you're going but I feel like a lot of times also we have graduates who feel entitled in terms of thinking that they are meant like you know oh because I got because I you know I got this master's then my first show my first job should be I should be the CEO how <laughs> you know being a you know when you're when you basically when you you um you do whatever degree you do mm -hmm. it's very different from leading people you need the experience you know you need to learn the work culture you need to learn how to manage people because managing people is another issue you know how do you get them to be productive how do you have systems where there's accountability and making sure that people are not stealing from you and you know all these types of things and it comes with experience so sometimes yeah. we're too quick to jump the gun and we, we want to be the ceo but you're not ready yes you've got the paper but in yeah. reality you're not ready and i know sometimes it's a bit hard to hear but that's the truth so i think we also need to just also manage our expectations and be willing to get the experience first and then if you've got a goal like this is where i'm going you will get there so yeah i think those would probably be my my advice well said. Um, I actually like the, the experience part of it because this is why I love America. You can have all kinds of degrees, all mm -hmm. kinds of degrees. The first thing they ask you, do you have experience? <laughs> and the thing is, someone who just graduated from getting their master's and there's Nancy with, uh, let's say, 14 years, 15 years of experience as mm -hmm. being in the finance world, they're going to hire Nancy with the experience because you just graduated from wherever with no experience. Yeah. Yeah. So they have to trust somebody who's been in the shoes first 
compared to the person. So really setting the expectations is a great advice. Like set your expectations. If you have experience, um, let's say in London that you worked as an accountant, you have that proof. You also have to set expectations that they can also prove it, mm -hmm. that you did yeah. have that experience. So really, really good advice. Um, Chulu, I know you're working on so many things. For anybody who is listening, Chulu is the host of my favorite, one of my favorite podcasts, Africana Woman. So when I was reading your introduction, <laughs> um, know your roots and know um, what it stands for. Weakness. I had a question on that. Okay. Could you explain what, what that is? Oh, I love it. Okay, so the term is know your roots, grow your purpose. And uh, I'll just reiterate, know is an abbreviation for knowledge, knowledge of who you are, whose you are. So I believe that I'm a child of God and I am uniquely and wonderfully made. So that means okay. anything is possible with the God that I serve. So know who you are, right? And then N is nourish. I think we have to be very intentional about what we are nourishing our bodies. Most of the times people are focusing on their um, physical bodies, but in reality, you've got your spiritual body, you've got your mental body. And, you know, a lot of people are healthy physically, but they're malnourished in their spirit and their mind. So mm. I think you have to be very intentional about what you're nourishing your whole self. Um, this is from everything that you're listening, you're watching, and you know, the things you expose yourself to. So that's nourish. And then O is operate in obedience. Um, as a Christian, I believe that we were put here for a purpose. And, um, you know, as Christians, you know, the Holy Spirit was sent to be a guide to us. And then I know for other religions, you say my intuition or whatever it is, but we're always being guided. We're always being spoken to. But most of the times we ignore it. We make excuses. Oh. So operating in obedience is making sure that you listen to that voice. You listen to the spirit telling you what you should be doing. What is your next step? You know, who are the people you should be aligning yourself with and not just oh, you know, whatever you dream of, but learn to actually hear and understand um, that word that is being spoken to, um, spoken to you. And then when we come to weakness, my favorite, <laughs> I think that when we are weak, that is when God is strong. So sometimes we want to always be the person that is doing everything in our own power. But the truth is we have to let God be God. You know, he puts the super in our natural. So you have to, uh, you have to come to a space where you say to yourself, I am not, I, I'm not, I'm not the one that can do everything in my life. Um, but I have this weakness and if i give it up to god he's gonna take me further and put me in spaces that i never even dreamed or imagined just because i had given myself up and said that i am weak god in this area help me to be a better person but then the other side of that is that i believe that so many times that we look at weakness and sometimes i'll say it's um the word failure we think it's a bad thing we think that oh when you fail at something then oh my god life is over but that's not the truth right i think failure and weakness are ways for us to acknowledge the areas in way in which we need to learn Mm. So yes, we fell down. Yes, we failed in, we applied for something and we didn't get it. But it doesn't mean that you as a person are um, not going to be able to, you know, achieve whatever goals you want to achieve. No, mm. you look at that situation and you say, what am I learning from this? How can I do better next time? So you pick yourself up and try again so for me weakness and failure is about redefining the way that i see the the world and the lens through which i look at it and it's not that i am a bad person or i should bring myself down mm. but it's about me learning to adapt learning from my experiences learning how i can be a better person and then the next time that i try it remember when i was talking about experience experience is all about failing if you're not failing in your business in your work 
there's a problem because you're not learning. When you have those challenges, you learn from them. Well, hopefully you're learning from them. And then you, you do better next time. You know better next time. You see the signs when you see, oh, I used to have a worker who was a bit dodgy and I can see the signs. You see it from a mile away because you have that experience. So, you know, don't, I think we just need to reframe the way that we look at weakness, reframe the way that we look at failure. Then not, it's not meant to bring you down, but it's actually meant to grow you. Preach. Okay. I'm, I'm dropping the mic. Speaker. Hi, I'm me, people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dropping the mic. I am dropping the mic, sis. This was so powerful. <laughs> I love it. No, I love it. If you are not trying and then, you know, you, you, if you're not failing, then you're not even trying. Mm, no, yeah. You're if, if you're not failing, you're not even trying. If you fail again, come up again, seven times, 10 times, 20 times. We all been there. Oh, well said. Well said. What else are you working on? that we can, you know, jump on, we can support you. You're supporting us, African women and women all over the world. How yeah. can we support you and what you work, what are you still working on? Okay, so I live in a little town that's called Kabwe and I have a local business, which is um, uh, an events place. So basically it's called Komushi Designs. And it's funny, everybody reads, this, reads it as Kamushi. And then I'm like, no. That's how I was reading it. <laughs> I don't know, but whenever someone goes, they'll be like, is that Kamushi? And I'm like, no, Nikomushi. And then they're like, oh. <laughs> then it oh, Kumu oh like the village. Yes. So I'm translating it for everybody else around the world. Yes. The so village. It's, you know, it's like going back home to the village, you know. Mm. But I think in a, in a sense, when I was naming it, I wanted it to become an empowering word because a lot of people think that, oh, the village. Yeah, I can never go back to the village, you know, that type of thing. So, but I was... <laughs> <laughs> when you come here, it's, it's beautiful gardens, beautiful, serene spaces that you are able to use and utilize so you can have events and things like that. Um, so I also am the founder of Africana Woman and Africana Woman has a podcast, as Nancy has mentioned. We have a blog. So please do read the blog. It's, uh, I, I it's invite you guys. I invite you. But it's thought provoking. <laughs> so we've got a blog as well. And then we have a community which is called Africana Women Visionaries because, you know, we, I believe that we're in an age where African women are really just the future. We are, we are envisioning so much of how mm. the world should be, how the world we want it to be. You know, we want to create generational wealth. So in that community, we are connecting you with other African women. So this is women in the diaspora. This is women in the continent. And we connect you. We have virtual events. We, um, you know, we've got a book club. We have different um, experts that come in and speak to us, whether it's about our businesses, our mental health, you know, our wellness, like I mentioned, all the different types of health that you should be looking at. Uh, you know, so we do different types of events. So becoming a member of Africana Women Visionaries, I believe you can't go wrong because there you find like-minded, like-hearted women. Wow. Um, and I am, I, I, it's just, a, it's, it's such a beautiful space. We have mixes. So those are networking events. And yeah, so that's the visionaries. Now, the very exciting part that I'm very excited to announce is that we are having, we have now, we're going to launch, sorry, on June 1st, our first um, co-working space and a hub. So we started in 2020. Mm. And all of the events, most of the events that we, we were doing were virtual. Why? I know because of the pandemic and things like that but you know I think we're now at a stage where people are comfortable with interacting with each other so mm -hmm. I'm very excited to have a physical hub and a space where people can come and work um so you can it's a co-working space you can come here to relax um there's different activities that we're doing and it's at Kumushi Gardens so please look that up I mean 
if you want to learn more about what I'm doing and more about our spaces, um, you can go to africanawoman.com. So Africana with an A at the end, africanawoman.com. And basically our world will open up to you. Oh my goodness. Listen, uh, Kumushi. Mm -hmm. Every time I see the pictures, I was like, oh my God, when I go to Zambia, I just want to go relax. It, right? but it looks so relaxing the gardens Indeed. even the grass i'm just like oh i i, I want that <laughs> but yes people please uh follow my girl uh on africana woman she's on facebook instagram her playground is instagram I yes, know that. my playground is instagram you will find me at chulu by design yeah. um yeah, so I'm I'm on Instagram. I like Instagram. And then, yeah. So I ask everybody who comes on, um, at this point in your life, have you found your concrete pastures? Ooh, you know what? I think, yeah, I think I have. I have found my concrete pastures. Um, like you said in the bio, I'm at peace. There's a lot that has happened in my life. Um, so many things that um, could have knocked me down, knocked me out, like I wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. But at this stage in my life, I feel that I'm at peace, you know. I I wake up and I can work my office, literally, I'm looking out at the gardens, you know, it's so beautiful. I can go take a stroll and it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a magical space to be in. Really beautiful, really beautiful. And um, lastly, you know, I can talk to you forever. <laughs> <laughs> lastly, I want to um, ask you if you have any quote, since I leave a quote for my audience all the time. Uh, do you have a quote that you live by or inspirational? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, <laughs> so for me, I believe that everyone should dream big. So it's dream big, just start and evolve. Um, I can break it down for you, but that's the quotes that I always tell the ladies that I coach, um, the ladies that I teach. I want you to dream big. Dreaming is free. You know, I don't understand why people limit themselves. <laughs> Sometimes we're too scared of our dreams, but it's okay. Dream big and just start. So many times there, you know, something has been placed on our heart. Like I, like when I go back to you have a purpose, like you had this on your heart to start yeah. coffee pastures. And we make excuses and say, oh, no, I'm a mother. Um, my kids are still young, so I, I can only start when they're teenagers. So, you know, Nancy could be, by, she, would, she maybe should have made it when, in like 10 years. And then uh -huh. we wouldn't be benefiting from this. You know what I mean? So don't make those, ex those excuses. Just start because you don't know who's going to come in your life to bless you and help you with pushing that dream forward and then evolve again you know like I said before if you're not failing you're not trying then it means you're not growing so evolving is about not being scared to to change because in the change you're learning and you it's it's, it's much better for you yeah oh my goodness well said I hope oh all of you guys are writing these things down. She's poured into this community on, on a whole different level. You, my dear, I'm so grateful to you for pouring into this community. And we could talk forever. I, <laughs> I'm so grateful for you being here. Uh, I've had fun because when we were starting, I was like, I don't know what's going to come out, but let's run with it. So it's been great. <laughs> so it's the same thing with me. I, this is the first time I've actually freestyled. Mm -hmm. I normally have my questions lined up. I had an idea of what I, direction I wanted to go in, but mm -hmm. I was like, let me just have this conversation. Let me freestyle with her and see yeah. where it goes. <laughs> but this was fun. Thank you.